text, John 18, verses 15 through 24. Let's stand in honor of God's word. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl, who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? I said, I am not. Now the servant and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me. What I said to them, they know what I said. When he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Let's pray. Father, as we uh, look at this night, and it's a familiar passage, we, we, should, we cannot uh, ever get used to it. Help us not to get used to it. That the reality is he hit the high priest, the great high priest, to defend the, uh, at best, representative high priest. Uh, Lord, we ask, Father, that you would help us to now see uh, your grace. Help us to see the hope that we can have in the middle of difficulty, in the difficulty that we're hearing in Ukraine, and, but really in our own lives, that, that this passage would stand up one more time, that we'd see the relevance of Christ in every area of life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Just some quick background. So we've been talking about this for, I mean, John focuses on all these different things, but there was one who was going to betray him. We see that now he is betraying him. Uh, we see uh, that he's been, Jesus has been talking about this hour is coming, that, that he is going to be, uh, that he's going to die. He's, there's this anticipation. He tells them the spirit is coming. It's actually to your advantage that I leave. And as, as someone who's been walking with him all their lives or at this for the last few years, to be told that he's leaving and that's better for them was foreign to them. This is probably Friday, April 3rd, AD 33. You can make a, a, a debate for, the th- for 30, but very likely it was Friday, April 3rd, AD 33, when this, this is going on. I think it's important to see, I think Ukraine's time helps us to situate ourselves a little bit better, at least it's helped me. Ukraine uh, has seen, uh, there's this sense of hopelessness. So I'm looking, thinking about my friends, I'm like, if this happened, again, we're a different country, I get that, but like, if I were there, now, there's this sense of hopelessness. That was my thing. I'm like, golly, they don't have much. Humanly, this is not great. Uh, and and they, that's what's going on here. You're looking at Jesus. If you've been following him, and you're like, this is not great. He's now been arrested. Um, he's standing with the high powers of the day, uh, and and the world is kind of undone if you're following him. And yet what we also know with the larger story that they didn't have access to, well, maybe kind of they did, but they didn't know that God was orchestrating the greatest act of mercy and forgiveness that the world has ever known. On that night, in the middle of that stuff, in the middle of that hopelessness, and that's what it would have looked like. You would not have had human hope looking at that situation, looking at Jesus, now taken and thought, oh, this is, this is fine. There's no hope. Like It's not in your power. Humanly, nothing's going to happen. And yet, this is what I want you to really get out of this whole passage that we look at today. Do not confuse the darkness of a single day with the end of the story. Do not confuse the darkness of a day with the end of the story. We know the end of the story, and that's why you can actually have hope. And I mean it, you could say this in Ukraine today. Would I say that with caution and a lot of humility? Yes. But what I would also say is Jesus Christ actually is adequate for there. And that's what Nikolai is saying, actually. <laughs> we have a hope that's not here. Uh, and so come or whatnot, you know, and, and by the way, Nikolai's been working with persecuted church all over the place anyways, and so that's their normal life. So now it's now he's kind of living that in some ways. But I think this is important for us because it doesn't matter whether you're at war or whether you're in a hospital. Do not confuse the darkness of a day with the end of the story. The first thing I want you to see is this. The Jewish leadership want Jesus crucified. The Jewish leadership want him crucified. Look at verses 28 through 29. And they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. 
So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against them? They lead Jesus. It makes me think of Isaiah 53. It says he did not open his mouth. This is lamb who's being led to slaughter. Jesus, he says anything, but he doesn't say much. He doesn't put up a fight at all. It's early morning, so probably dawn, and they're doing business to get over with fast. But it's Passover season, and the Jewish leadership don't want to mess up Passover. They don't want to be ceremonially unclean or defiled by Gentile space. And so actually Pilate has to come to them. It's interesting that they're more concerned about being ceremonially unclean than the fact of all the moral brokenness and corruption and lies that they're doing. They're bothered by life. They just don't want to mess up their meal, I guess. I don't know. But it's just, you know, you, it's pretty thick when you're looking. And you're like, wow. But, you know, the heart is really amazing at deceiving you. Once you're convinced, you just can't see anything else. Look at verse 29. Pilate went outside to them. Now, he goes out to them, and he asks, what accusation do you bring against this man? Pilate was the governor of Judea between 26 and uh, 36 A.D. Uh, and, and you can actually, if you go to Caesarea today, there's a stone that talks about Pilate. So you can still see it like today. You can go see this stone that, that references him. Uh, but, but he really was a, a, a historical figure, and he is in a position of power. And yet Jesus is in front of him, and he's asking of the high priest, what are your charges? What do you want? Look at verses 30 through 31. They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The the, the reply, I mean, there's this ongoing kind of tension that you probably already know, that the people of Israel have some kind of autonomy and some kind of jurisdiction to do certain um, judgments, but there's a big tension between Rome and and them. There's this kind of sass that's perpetual. Uh, and, 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 and basically Pilate says, just judge him by your own law. Why are you wasting my time? And, and, but their reply is interesting. So he says, he, he says that. Judge by your own law, you have your own jurisdiction. Now look at the second part of 31. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Ah, this is what we're talking. It's not just a matter of try him. It's that we want him put to death. And they don't have the authority to do capital punishment legally, right? They might have done it, but they did not do it legally. And this was to fulfill the word, actually, that Jesus had spoken to show about what kind of death he was going to die. The reason they had to come to Pilate is because it was not lawful to put this man to death. They could not do it legally. This, is, this clarifies the weight of the charges, but it also depicts the complete rejection of Jesus. They don't just not want him. They want him gone. They don't want to hear him ever again. They don't ever hear his words or see him breathe again. They want him gone. Rome has to authorize this. Look at verse 32. That this is also that fulfills the word that Jesus had spoken to show what kind of death he was going to die. He knew full well, and he's going willingly to this death. It's not an accident. While they're morally accountable for their choosing and what they're doing, Jesus is doing this willingly. John 3, if you think of before the 316, John 3.16, before it, it says, As Moses was lifted up uh, the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. There's this anticipation that the cross is coming, and not just any death, not stoning, the cross specifically. Why did they want him crucified? Why did they want him crucified? Dead? Okay, that's not good. But he, they want him crucified, and the reason is this, at least. A hanged man is cursed by God. If he's hung on a cross, it gives the picture to anyone looking on, that is not the Messiah. That's not the Messiah. Because Deuteronomy talks about this. His body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him uh, the same day, for a hanged man is cursed by God. So the picture is that if Jesus is hung on a cross, and they can get him to hang him on a cross, that they will view him as a cursed man. This is not of God. You can reject him, because God would never let his Messiah die like that. That's cursed. Complete rejection. Galatians 3 actually explains this a little bit more. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. God was conveying some things too. He really was cursed like that. The Messiah was cursed, actually. He was judged like God hating sin in his life. He puts it on display. He dies on a real cross. We see this later. But cursed is everyone who's hanged on the tree. So see a few things here for us to think about. It recalls, again, the hopelessness of Ukraine and and ongoing these difficulties. At this day, 
they're still talking about his death. And if you're looking on, there is not a lot of hope that is going on. It also shows us moral blindness. You can justify a lot of junk uh, to if you've rejected the truth. And these wicked hearts are justifying murdering a man who everyone says was innocent everywhere. There's not a place. Like, you don't tell your enemies, show me my sin, because they will certainly come with it. What they do, change the subject. The most good man, he wasn't just a man that has ever lived, was completely rejected by these people. But he does it for us too. The cost of redemption, what we're seeing just at the beginning here, is this cost of redemption. The cost of saving sinners like us is a perfectly righteous, perfectly good man. But it couldn't just be a man. It had to be a man who is God also. He had to take the sin of the whole world, and he had to be morally flawless. Morally flawless, and no one you know, no one else you know could do this. So they want him crucified because they want the picture of him being condemned by God and cursed of God. They're kind of right, but they're wrong also. Second thing I want you to see is the governor meets the king. Look at verse 33. The governor meets the king. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the king of the Jews? Again, Rome is the power of the day, and there's not going to be, he's not share, they're not sharing who's king. So the question, really the only question that Pilate has is, are you the king of the Jews? Because if that's the, the story, you've got a problem. And that's really what the Jews are trying to pass off. If this guy's committed, committed treason, then, then Rome can actually put him to death on their law. And so that's what's going on. The, he, the question that Pilate has for him is, are you the king of the Jews? Look at his reply. And there's 34. Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Look at, isn't this interesting that Jesus, again, he just looks like a man, but he's not just a man. He's replying to the guy who is humanly in power in front of him, the most weighty person in the space. And he says, um, is that your question or did someone else give it for you? He's just not afraid. He doesn't have to be. But what's interesting is he taps Pilate's heart, in my opinion. I think he taps Pilate's heart because Pilate was a made man. Matthew 27, 19 brings a backstory. Now, I don't know if it happened here or later, just so you know. The timing isn't stated. But in Matthew 27, 19, it describes a terrible night's sleep. I just told you I was having a terrible night's sleep. Well, apparently Pilate's wife had one. Uh, Matthew 27, 19 says this. Besides, while he was sitting on judgment seat, this is Pilate, his wife sent word to him. And this is what the word was. His loving wife. Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. You're going to want to leave him alone. And again, I don't know if this is before or after. I can't tell you that. But I do know this is going on. God is doing things, other things too. And there is this sense of you, you don't want to do this humanly. Don't want to do this. They're going to. But it's not like God is not saying, you're not going to defy this one. He does it anyways. Uh, but the question he actually says, I just think this is a tap. And he does this to anyone. He doesn't care who you are. He's not, I'm telling you, Putin braves borrowed air. He really does. I mean, Jesus Christ speaks, knows where he was born, knows every thought he's ever had, and the same thing for you, and the same thing for me, and the same thing for Pilate. And on this day, he says, is that your question? And Pilate has to answer. His reply is this, am I a Jew? Which is basically something like saying, I'm not under you. This is kind of every human heart towards Jesus, actually. It's interesting. Who are you to ask me questions about my heart? Am I a Jew? I have jurisdiction. I'm only here to find out whether you're guilty or not. And Jesus is like, there's a judge going on. There's some judgment going on. It's not just from, from Pilate. Look at verse 35. Your own nation and the religious leaders handed you over. What have you done? What would cause a country to turn its back on one of its own? It's done, right? <laughs> but often an honorable country does not do that easily. In fact, I traveled. I know where I was going. I was flying back 
in a plane one day, and I met a guy who was still trying to go find um, missing soldiers, MIA uh, people. And it's been like 20, I don't know how many years, this guy would go annually to try and do this data research. They're trying to find their own. So what does it take to abandon your own? That's what they've done. And that's what Pilate is saying. Your own people have turned their back on you, and they're asking for your head, basically. Look at your replies. Jesus answered in verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting. I would never have come this far, not like this, that I might not be delivered to the Jews, but my kingdom is not of this world. That's what he says. My kingdom is not of this world. There's a spiritual kingdom, and there's a Roman kingdom. And the spiritual kingdom has been here forever. So more thoughts here for us to look at. Remember what Jesus has said in John's gospel already. We've seen that he has authority like no one else. He is the healer. He displaces authority over sickness, over death. We see he walks on water, that he's the author of life, that he's the good shepherd who also lays down his life for the sheep. That's who Pilate's talking to. He's not just a man. Pilate is also on trial. Basically, the question for Pilate is, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? He thinks he's just quizzing some guy, but the fact is even his wife has been going, he's not normal. And then he's looking at this man, and he's saying, "Um, are you a king? And his reply is, not from here. He's got a huge reputation. Somehow he's gotten the most powerful people among his people hating him because he's a threat to Look at the third point. Tragic, Pilate tragically misses Jesus. Pilate tragically misses Jesus. Look at verse 37. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. He says this. This is the purpose. This is why I actually came. There's a reason why I'm standing here right now, was what he was saying. I've come here to witness to the truth. He is is a king who reveals ultimate truth, and his truth leads to actual eternal life. His people believe in an eternal kingdom that's been granted because of him. He's revealing. Jesus is the fullest revelation of what God is saying. If you look at his life and what he says, it's the clearest picture of who God is and what he's about. I have a a professor friend who, who, one of his peers growing up is, is a genius, and the professor is kind of the same. And he was telling his skeptical friend about the fact that we have a word from the Lord. That we're not guessing what God thinks. He's revealed some things in his word and in the person of Christ. And the skeptical guy said, if that is true, that is one of the most astounding things that can possibly be. Take a look at your Bible real quick. That's what you have that God has given you a word, actually. And he's revealed it in the person of Christ as well. And on this day, he's revealing that his kingdom is a kingdom of truth. And everyone of the truth, he says, listens to my voice. When you're part of him, you actually want what is true. You want to conform to what he has said. I like what F.F. Bruce says. The kingdom of which Jesus is speaking is the kingdom of truth. The citizens that the kingdoms are of of that kingdom are those who love the truth. Citizens of Christ's kingdom love truth, the truth. And they listen to him because they recognize their true king. Truth is the instrument God uses to call men and women into his kingdom. Think about it for a second. Truth is the instrument God uses to call men and women into this kingdom. Think about it. The Spirit convicts us of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. He convicts us of sin in this way. Sin is like, I've actually done moral wrong. So I have to tell myself the truth about sin, right? If I deny it, I'm like, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't do anything. I didn't do that. That's not I'm, not, I'm not in the truth. But when I know and I acknowledge the truth of my sin, I'm able to hear. I'm able to recognize that I, have a, 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 I need a Savior. Righteousness, that there is a standard. When you think of that truth, that there is righteousness, that there really is an, an objective standard of right and wrong, that it's, there's, preferences are irrelevant. <laughs> there is a standard. He convicts us of sin of righteousness, and of judgment. Not only that we have a problem, 
that we're actually accountable for it. And we will be held accountable for it. We actually really want justice, by the way. It stinks when you watch, you know, if, if you, if, if, sorry, Putin's in the news. Now, like, if he just gets away with whatever, you just take the next country, just take the next country, just take the next, like, there's something in me, at least, that's like, uh, that seems bad. <laughs> Not really. I think that's terrible. Like, especially if you're going to capture freedom and, and send people under your power, there's something that's very bent about that. But Jesus, his kingdom is the kingdom of, of truth. His people love the truth, and truth is the instrument he calls us. Isn't it the truth to you? Did God not convict you? If you belonged to him, was there not a moment in your life where you became aware that you were not fine? You told yourself the truth. The Spirit convicted you that you were not fine. You finally believed the truth because you weren't. You were guilty. It was true. And you recognize, I have this need of a Savior. I'm conscious that I need a Savior. Really. Not kind of. I actually need help. I need rescue. But then I believe the truth of this, that Jesus paid the whole thing. That Pastor Moon said this right, that we need to remember and know that we are loved. That God does not just hate us. What He's doing on this day, He is entirely just. Absolutely just. But you better believe he loves you. This is an act of grace. When he comes in time and space and he takes all this mess, he does it out of love. And that's what he says. Greater love has no man than the one who gives life for his friends. He does this. God demonstrates his own what? Love. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one only son. Love is who he is. If you look in 1 John God is love. It's because of love that he's here. And so because of love that he's standing in front of him. I actually think, if you want my opinion, that he was tapping Pilate. And I think if Pilate had gone, wife's not normally like that, you know, who are you? Who do you say I am? I think Jesus would respond to him. If you want my thoughts. Could God have worked out his plan Despite these things, yes, I'm just saying, I think Pilate could have responded. He foreknew, not confused, but I think Pilate could have responded. Onward. Look at verse 38. Pilate's reply to this question is this. Pilate said to him, what is truth? What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside the Jew, to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt to him. Pilate skeptically asks this question, what is truth? And this is the thing that if you said most places around here right now, what is truth? They go, that I have, people will still say this, our truth is X. Our truth is X. Like, that's not truth. That's a subjective, you might say, I, I like vanilla ice cream, and that would be a subject, a, an objective reality about a subjective preference. I did say it correctly. Well, I'm going to look at it later. It's, a, it's a, an objective claim about my subjective preference, but there is a standard. There really is a God, and he is in the flesh here. The, but, but Pilate's question, what is truth, is kind of like to punt to everyone has their own truth. Everyone has their own story. Everyone's right. But this doesn't really work. The mountain, there's, there's an, a story that's used often to convey that all religions are the same. That basically we all have the same belief system, mostly. It's like, it tells the story of a mountain. And the way it uses it is that everyone is kind of getting to the top of the mountain and they're going in different pathways. Top of the mountain, right? You imagine a mountain with multiple pathways. That makes sense. But it doesn't really work because what we're saying that Jesus is, is he is from the top of the mountain. And he came down the pathways. <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm not that pathway. I'm, I'm, this is, I am the truth. There's only one. He is speaking. That's what revelation is. He's come down. And look at what he is. He came down from the top of the mountain, lived, revealed, taught, healed, reversed the effects of the fall, died for his people, conquered death, transformed lives, and he sends his people, prodigal sons and daughters, into a broken world to tell of the love of God. He has spoken. The top of the mountain is not vague. He's talking. Revelation is that. He's made himself known. But then second, look at what Pilate declares. I find no guilt in him. 
think about Jesus a little bit. Think about how many times people say that. I don't see any guilt in him. Maybe I don't like him. <laughs> like that, I like him. I'm just saying that's what's kind of being said. They don't like who he is. They don't like what he makes them, how he makes them feel. But they continue, continually say there's no guilt in him. Pilate tragically misses Jesus. Pilate, though, is a great mirror for us. Don't miss Jesus. Pilate is literally standing in front of God. God the Son, in the flesh. And he even acknowledges this man is actually innocent. But he doesn't respond well. He's given this opportunity, I think. He could be set free by the truth, and his answer is, what's truth? And he goes on. The last point that we see is the all-good king is condemned and a, and a rebel is set free, is freed. That's correct. Look at verses 39 through 40. But you have a custom. So Pilate is, has, has already said, look, he's, he's not worthy of that. He, he is not guilty like you want him to. He's not worthy of death. He comes out and he says, look at verse 39. But you have a custom. I should release one man for you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And other passages in Scripture elaborate. He wasn't just a robber. He was a murderer. He was an insurrectionist. And the chance that will come. For Bar Abbas, the son of God. Bar is son, Abba, father. Son of the father. Interesting. Barabbas, Barabbas, Barabbas. That's who they want out. While the actual son of the father <laughs> is going to go and die. The all good king is condemned and a rebel is freed. Barabbas is the only is only the beginning of rebels freed at our all all good king's expense. Barabbas is the only only the beginning of a list of rebels, and I'm on them. This king dies, and a rebel who really is a rebel is free. It's the only physical situation, right? He's the one physical sub like that. But spiritually, Jesus stands in our place. What he's this is just a glimpse of what he's doing in such a huge way. A guy who is utterly unfit to be free, if anyone's honest for a moment, is now walking around. I don't know if he stayed free, <laughs> but he's now, he is literally set free, and Jesus will die. Interesting. What about us? In the middle of all this stuff, do not confuse the darkness of a single day with the end of the story. The fact is, everything is saying, this righteous man will die. And this unrighteous guy is going to go free. And yet the rest of the story is that Jesus is making life. There's going to be, this is an act of mercy. This is an act of grace and an act of justice. That the justice of God is satisfied also. That the wages of, that, of sin, of my real sin, is a real death. The wages of real human sin is real human death. And Jesus dies physically on a cross about 2,000 years ago. And everyone who will trust in him, you're like Barabbas. A rebel goes free, and the king dies. I think it's worth, you know, but I just wanted to remind you of the kind of stuff that he still does. I said this earlier, uh, Nikolai. But Nikolai is, uh, he's in Ukraine, and he's, thank you for the quote. <laughs> I'll tell you in a minute. You can read it now. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, but the uh, Nikolai literally, they came, they came into his office. I think he was an atheist. I don't know what he was. But he was kind of searching. He was kind of maybe reading Bibles or something like this, kind of just going, what's going on in life? And this guy who was literally afraid to be there, it's like a student or something, was nervous about coming to him, still tells him, do you know for certain if you're to die today that you'd go to heaven? And God took a guy who was beneath him socially and led that man to faith. And he loves Christ, and he's been in a lot of difficult situations, but he's a fantastic man of God. And these are his words to Terry. You know, Thank you very much, brother. We're okay, safe, no panic. That's what's going on right now. We remember that here on earth, 
We remember we are, we are just guests and travelers. Our homeland is heaven. Here is Nikolai. This is the story of real believers. Because Nikolai's from another kingdom now, right? He's no longer like just from here. He says, I've got a homeland that can't be shaken by Russia ever, ever. Do what you will. You can't take this. And he knows that. And this is your story. The moment that you trust Christ, you entrust your life to him. You turn from your sins. You trust in what he did for you. He makes you a son and a daughter. You become part of this, this family, actually, of heaven. That's what we celebrate in the Lord's Supper today. We're remembering something that's been passed down for years. Do this as a remember, in remembrance of me. And the reason is we forget. And God has made it so that we do not. Let me pray for us. Lord God, I pray that you would uh, use this, that you would help us to remember to not to confuse the darkness of a single day with the end of the story. The reality is this is just the beginning of what's going to happen. This is a kind of hopeless situation humanly. And yet what we know is that you will ultimately actually die, physically die, and yet you will conquer the grave. Lord God, there are lots of needs among us. Uh, I, I pray that you would address a lot of things. One, that we would be truthful, that we would acknowledge our sin, that we would not hide from it and make excuses for it. Instead, we'd come into the light and say, Lord, change me, please. You do this and everyone you come near, change me too. And that's whether you're a short-term Christian or a long-term, there's so much more junk that has to come out that you're conforming us into the image of Christ. But I also pray for those who don't know you yet, that there would be this, this real clear awareness that you love them and that you are about to prove it, at least in John's context that we're looking at, you're about to prove it with your whole life. Lord, I pray that that would be our story, that we would live as people who recognize we're from another kingdom. We still have to be faithful stewards here and great citizens here, but our citizenship, our primary citizenship is in heaven, and it's unshakable. We pray in Jesus' name. Thanks.